Hi, welcome to Storymakers. I'm Rocco Steno, and with me today is Mary Rose Wood. She's the author of The Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place. Oh! oh. Well, I know you're greeted that way often, so tell us why. Well, I think it probably has to do with the premise of the series. The first book in the six-book series is called The Mysterious Howling, and it begins um, the story of Miss Penelope Lumley, who, when we meet her, is a 15-year-old girl, a recent graduate of the Swanburn Academy for Poor Bright Females. And she's on her way to her very first job interview for the position of governess at a grand house called Ashton Place. And she's responding to an advertisement that she saw while she was at school. And it asks for the kind of skills that one would expect of a typical you know, governess in Victorian England. You know, she needs to be able to teach watercolor painting and a smattering of Latin and some mathematics. But the ad also says that experience with animals is strongly preferred. Mm. She doesn't know what that means. She goes to the interview. She does not meet the children, and nobody will answer any questions about them. But Lady Constance Ashton, the lady of the house, hires her on the spot and sends her to her room to unpack. And only after she settled in her room and accepted the job and signed the contract, does she hear this mysterious howling sound out the window of her room, goes dashing out to discover what it is, because she assumes it's some wounded animal, and she's very tender-hearted about animals, and realizes that the three children, whom she's been hired to teach, were actually raised by wolves. They're not the children of the Ashtons. They were found running wild and barking and howling in the forest by Lord Frederick while he was out on a hunting expedition. So now they not only have to be taught, but they have to be tamed. And so that's part of the ongoing mystery of the series is Penelope's efforts um, to you know, bring these children more in line with what uh, civilized children should be like, but also to discover who they are and how they got left in the woods and why. And um, as is so often the case with a mystery, once you start to dig, you find other mysteries are attached to it. And so some mysterious stuff about her own background also comes into play. And Lord Frederick Ashton um, is quickly revealed to be a, a, a very odd fellow and often not to be found on the full moon. So there's a lot of intertwined um, storylines that take six books to untangle. That premise is pretty unusual. How did you come up with that? Well, I have to say that I am both a big fan of animals. I'm a longtime vegetarian. I have a dog and two cats at home. And I'm also a big fan of the book Jane Eyre. And so when casting about for an idea to write about, as writers do, um, the collision between my desire to write a Victorian governess novel and my desire to write about animals kind of took on a life of its own. I have to also say that I found inspiration in the tales of Curious George, which my son was addicted to when he was a little boy and I felt that the uh, combination of the child who acted like an animal and the animal who acted like a child there's this kind of gray area with Curious George you know is he a little boy or is he a monkey it's never quite you know clear it had such appeal to a young reader um, that that kind of empowered me to come up with child characters who had this animal like quality now there are four books and number five is coming out. Tell us a little bit about number five. It's called The Unmapped Sea. It's book five in a planned six book series. So it is the penultimate book in the series, which was a really, um, it's a really exciting and challenging creative task for a writer to plan a story that actually unspools over the course of six full length novels. And book five is such a climactic spot because I have to um, sort of gather up all the threads of all the stories that have been, uh, you know, entangled. The plot has thickened and thickened and thickened and thickened, and now I have to kind of, you know, ready, set, go to set up book six in which everything will get resolved and revealed and, you know, the sort of climactic payoff that I've been building up to. So book five was hugely challenging and so much fun to write. Um, introduced a bunch of new characters, takes place by the sea, new settings. Uh, Brighton? Brighton, oh, in fact. Okay. You guessed correctly now, uh, again. This was always a six book series. Yes. Yeah, we, when we began the series. Um, in 2010, so that's almost a book a year. It is, in fact, a book a year. And each one has crept 
up a little longer than the previous one, as series tend to do, which I think is uh, just a natural function of storytelling because the world of the books gets bigger with each book. There's more secondary characters, there's more plot threads, there's, you know, um, more backstory. And so the books tend to, they get, they get a little bit longer, but they haven't gotten epic yet. You can still lift them, mm -hmm. I promise. It must be uh, difficult to have to bid farewell to the three children and Penelope. So how are you going to handle that? I might cry. Be able to do that? <laughs> I might howl a few sad tears, um, but I'm th really excited to begin work on the sixth book. And uh, I know that the first four books will be repackaged when the fifth one comes out, but the original four books have the illustrations done by someone we all know, and that is... John Klassen, yeah. wonderful illustrator, who created the look of the first four books. And um, we were so lucky to have him. And uh, He's a busy guy right now. He's a super busy guy. And now that the, you know, the series is continuing and we're doing a, a repackage of the entire series, we are thrilled to be working with Eliza Wheeler as the new illustrator. So the repackaging of the series will also launch in April 2015, which is when The Unmapped Sea will be published. Well, it's time to play a little game. Let's play. <laughs> become your book character. <laughs> so we're going to ask you to become Penelope Lumley. If you like. Today we have the governess Penelope Lumley with us and we're going to... Mr. Steno, if you don't mind, Miss Lumley would be more appropriate. We've only just met. Oh, so I can't call you Penny, huh? Not until we've been properly introduced. Okay, so I have a few questions for you. There are several members of the Ashton family, and you must have a favorite. It would not be politic for me to choose favorites among my employers, but um, I will say that Lady Constance has uh, on occasion treated me with not entirely the respect that one would uh, offer a professional educator. She's asked me to take dictation on occasion, which I don't feel is part of my responsibilities. Um, but I do think that she potentially could have been a Swanburne girl herself if she had been had the benefits of a good education. Tell us a little bit about uh, Lord Frederick's mother. The widow Ashton, yes, I did meet her once. Uh -huh. She did come by to visit the house rather unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. She's called the widow Ashton because um, her husband, Edward Ashton, met a gruesome end uh, by drowning in a gooey medicinal tar pit while on a spa vacation, or so everyone believes. Oh, hmm. So, I know it's not politic, but I must ask, is there one of the three children that uh, is your favorite? Well, they're all so darling and so different. Um, you know, Alexander is very, um, very mature, and I feel he probably has a great future ahead of him as a navigator or a sea captain. He has tremendous leadership ability, and he loves maps. Beowulf is an artist and a poet at heart and um, is doing better in his efforts to stop gnawing on things when nervous. We've, we've come a long way. And little Cassiopeia, of course, is um, quite uh, fierce of temper and uh, very fond of math, which uh, is very helpful because the multiplication tables can be quite tricky, particularly the sevens and eights. We all have a struggle with those. I know I do. We all know you went to the Swinburne Academy for poor and clever, smart, poor you know, and smart. Mr. Stainer, yes. allow me to correct you because Lady Constance has the exact same problem. I don't know why it's so difficult for her to remember. She's always going on about swan song or swan sea. It's the Swanburne Academy for poor, bright females. Oh, bright females. Named after our esteemed founder, Agatha Swanburne, who was an absolute whiz at pithy wise sayings, and um, we're all very grateful for her wisdom. Give us one of her pithy sayings. Oh, I would be delighted. Um, I believe I have one written down right here. As Agatha Swanburne once said, that which can be purchased at a shop is easily left in a taxi. That which you carry inside you is difficult, though not impossible, to misplace. Profound. And I'm sure you must know the school song. Can you share that with us? Oh, yes. All of the Swanburne girls know the um, school song by heart. Um, if I may read you the words, because sure. it's, it's actually, they're worth savoring, I would say. 
All hail to our founder, Agatha. Pithy and wise is she. Her sayings make us clever and don't take long to tell. When do we quit? Never. How do we do things? Well. We strive to be like dear Agatha. Cheerful and brave are we. Our hard work makes us lucky. We're optimistic too. How do we feel? Plucky. We're Swanburne through and through. Well, that's terrific. Well, thanks for joining us, Miss Lumley, and we cannot wait to see what uh, develops in book five. And we're going to find Mary Rose somewhere here. <laughs> I'm back. Oh, well, thank <laughs> you. So I understand there's now music for the school song. There is music, and I have to confess that my own background in the musical theater uh, makes me jump at the chance to write a song lyric whenever it comes uh, up. And so that lyric was written by me, and the music is written by my longtime collaborator, the composer Andrew Gerla. And um, it was really a treat to hear that song. So we have a treat for our Kid Lit TV viewers as we leave the debut of the Swanburn School Song. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to work on your howling technique uh, sure. for a okay. minute. Yeah, okay. okay, so you just have to breathe from the belly. <gasps> okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. And just let it go. Ah, ooh. Ah, ooh. If you get a little bit more ooh in ooh. the lips. Great. Uh, okay, again. Ah, ooh. Nice. I fear, is your voice still changing? Uh, maybe. Just give it yes. another year. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay.